Thank you, Leonard and Charlie, and to the LA City Historical Society for inviting me to come and uh, talk about Whittier and my research. Uh, not always easy to find enthusiastic audiences for this topic. Um, I graduated with my master's from Cal State LA in the spring. I'm hoping that I'll be able to transition into teaching in community college, probably my first choice would be Rio Hondo up here on the hill in Whittier. And this research project was a convergence of my interest in the New Deal, in that era, some of the political discourses that were going on at that time. And I was actually interested in that before some of those things came back into vogue as um, politics went down some familiar roads in the last few years. And so it was an interesting opportunity to sort of delve into some of those questions of the 30s and see um, how it may be more complicated than we tend to remember those things. Hopefully you are now seeing an image of the main drag green leaf in Whittier uh, as it looked in 1930, right before the New Deal. One of the things that uh, tends to be true of scholarship dealing with the New Deal is that it looks at uh, big questions and it tends to look in them at those issues in binaries. Um, there's questions of left versus right, the, the New Deal save capitalism or did it destroy it? There's also investigations in particular movements uh, like Stephen Ross's book about fascist movements in uh, Los Angeles. And it tends to distill a very complicated area era into a couple of um, big questions that are being investigated. And what I wanted to do in this uh, research was take a very small community and be able to look at it in much, much um, deeper detail. So I wanted to look at how the people of Whittier engaged with the ideas and ideologies of the 1930s and try and look from the bottom up more than looking at the leaders and the people that were driving those narratives. And also see, could you say that the community fit in one bucket or did they tend to shift and cluster around different sets of ideas uh, and ideologies depending what those were and what can that tell us or teach us that can help us diffuse some of the polarization in our own age? And it was also interesting to compare a little bit the difference between history and memory of our community. And what I mean by that is that if you ask most people about Whittier, they know some of the movies that were filmed here. They know that it was founded as a Quaker colony in the 1880s. Uh, they know that um, some of the early boosters like Jonathan Bailey, the Wardman family, the Murphys, people that you see the names on the streets, they know that citrus and walnut ranching was one of the key industries. And of course they know that Richard Nixon um, came from here. They tend to be less familiar with some of the other industries and some of the other ideas and things that were being um, shared and talked about at the time. One of the things I tried to do was sort of look at all of the different cohorts in Whittier at that time. Uh, it's remembered today as a Quaker town, but by the 1930s, there was actually a very diverse set of Christian churches all of them very active in um, community boosterism. There were business owners. It was a town of 15,000, but there were a lot of shops, banks, um, that business uh, people owned. There was Whittier College, which was founded as a Quaker college because education was very important to Quakers. So we had the college professors there that represented a slightly different group of um, ideologues. We had the ranchers that owned the ranches both the big landowners that owned Murphy Ranch and Leffingwell Ranch, and the majority of the ranchers that tended to have small land holdings, and it wasn't their full-time job. They had other business interests as well. There was also a vibrant Mexican and Mexican-American community that wasn't necessarily seen as part of Whittier by white Whittierites, but they were here in the ranches as a labor force and as neighbors. And there was a group of influencers that we'll talk about a little bit more that were the people that came through Whittier and participated in intellectual discourse um, as, they, as they traveled. Now, for the purpose of this, I'm gonna try and keep it to 20 minutes because I could go on for hours and hours and hours. I'm gonna focus on three areas. I'm gonna talk about the Whittier Citrus Strike in 1936, which happened just a little bit after the one in La Havre was much shorter and uh, much um, less traumatic to the community than the La Havre one. I'm gonna talk about the people that were the anti-New Deal um, political uh, leaders here. And I'm gonna talk about the peace movement because pacifism was important to the Quakers and also intersected with a lot of other movements in the 1930s. 
Now, talking about the New Deal in Whittier, generally speaking, most of the business leaders, the ranch owners were opposed. Uh, this is a full page ad boosting Herbert Hoover and each of the leading organizations took turns taking ownership of full page ads in the Whittier News in the weeks leading up to the election. This included the Citrus Growers Association, the Suncrest Organization, uh, it even included the Whittier News itself paid for a full page ad. Uh, the owner of the Whittier News was a vehemently anti-New Deal person himself, Rex Kennedy. Herbert Hoover himself was a Quaker, so there was community affinity for him as well as for his politics. And there were connections to his campaign. Walter Dexter, who was the president of Whittier College in the 20s, became a member of his campaign and actually wrote his official biography. And of course, Herbert Hoover's wife lived in Whittier for a time. Now, among the anti-New Dealers, there was two sets of responses to the New Deal. There was grudging support, uh, and I read through many oral histories that were preserved by the Richard Nixon Oral History Project. And there were many accounts where people said, you know, we didn't like it, but we saw that it did something for the community. Uh, one person mentioned that the policies led to him getting a job because it shortened the number of hours working a week and that enabled him to get a job. So he felt he owed FDR his vote in the 1936 election. And then there was a second group that um, just hated the New Deal, no matter what. They saw it as an effort to give out handouts, um, to buy the votes of poor people, to um, Im implement policies that would incentivize relief instead of uh, people wanting to work. Now, Whittier did benefit and had a lot of New Deal projects. The Whittier Post Office, which is in this photograph, is still here today. There was a new sewer system uh, implemented. And the city engineer was an anti-New Dealer himself. And when asked if it was hypocritical that their city was taking advantage of these programs, his rationale was, we're going to be paying off this debt anyway as taxpayers. We may as well take advantage of the proceeds from the um, New Deal itself. Now, I'm going to segue a little bit because I want to set up some background for the citrus strike. Um, in 1934, when strikers uh, left their work in the Central Valley, protesting conditions, um, they didn't have a lot of support. The New Deal did provide protection for organized labor, but agricultural workers were explicitly excluded from that. And the white labor organizations didn't have an interest in helping the agricultural workers in California, who were predominantly um, Latinx folks or Asian Americans and generally non-white Americans. The Communist Party stepped in and provided support organizing um, these groups. And uh, Carolyn Decker and Pat Chambers are two of the famous ones. You'll see them come up a lot in the literature that help organize. The owners of the agricultural community uh, expected that the strike would go the way strikes had normally gone. They would call the sheriff, they would complain, the sheriff would come out with a bunch of deputies with sticks, they'd beat the workers, the workers would give up and go back to work. Um, instead, George Creel, who ran the Labor Relations Board, the New Deal administration in California, um, tried to defuse the situation and he provided relief for the striking workers. This confirmed everything that the agricultural growers feared about the New Deal. They were incensed. They were very angry and afterwards, um, they started strategizing how they would prevent the um, labor in California from organizing and being successful in the future. Uh, they started hiring influencers to sort of promote the idea of a Red Scare. They took advantage of the fact that um, members of the Communist Party helped help organize the workers and basically said, hey, there's a radical movement here to overthrow America. Uh, and that's what these people are trying to do. This isn't legitimate labor protesting working conditions. This is an ideology to change the direction of our country. And they actually hired influencers that would travel from community to community and speak in their service clubs, talking on the dangers of um, communist radical labor activists overthrowing their labor organizations. And in Whittier, Whittier for the size of its town, it had a very active service club community. And these service clubs would organize around different things. You know, the Rotary was about boosting the economy. Towns and clubs were about benefits for retired people. There was an association promoting um, college women. Uh, the Elks Lodge was sort of a, a brotherhood club that also had like insurance provisions for its members. And all of these clubs tended to have speakers come through. 
and they would have events, they would have schools come through and have the children would put on performances, they would do amusements, they would do fundraisers. And the intellectual discourse uh, was around many topics, but they started having these influencers coming through talking about the dangers of uh, radicalism. And they weren't all sponsored by the California growers. There were clubs and associations that were promoting these ideas themselves. The Civil Legion was a fascist movement um, that themselves were just against communism. They were against the New Deal. They were anti-Semitic and they sent their speakers too. So there was a steady diet of anti-communist uh, talk in these service clubs. Uh, this is the Whittier Women's Club where the Silver Legion had meetings and the Silver Legion actually had their own chapter in Whittier for a short time in 1934. Um, the discourse there was not just about communism, civil rights, Margaret Sanger came and speak. So there was a lot of different things being talked about in the clubs, uh, but for our purpose right now, we're really focused on um, sort of ideology and there was room in Whittier to say things that weren't anti-New Deal. Whittier College held a symposium where they concluded that socialism might be the best path to the US government. And that was, you know, nobody raised an eyebrow at that. Uh, but they were talking about it as a theoretical idea when it was rumored that they actually supported ham and eggs, that the Whittier College professors supported ham and eggs, which was a plan to give a $30 a month stipend to registered voters over 50. Um, People in Whittier, the business leaders were incensed because they were very opposed to that relief plan. And the president of the college actually had to um, publish a statement assuring people that no, the Whittier College professors were not supportive of any kind of uh, welfare program like that. How does this connect with the Latinx community in Whittier? So there were two predominant areas where you would find the Latinx community. One was this area on the western side of Whittier, known as Jimtown. Down at the bottom here is the Pio Pico Ranch that you can see today. Pio Pico was the last California governor um, from Mexico, and he, um, this community grew up on his ranch. Unlike agricultural workers in the Central Valley and the Imperial Valley, the community of agricultural workers in Whittier was somewhat stable. They didn't follow harvests because the crops growing in Whittier needed year-round attention, the citrus and the walnuts. So there were some people that came and went, but mainly this was a stable community. The other place uh, that they lived was in housing on the citrus ranches themselves. This is a map of the Murphy Ranch, and you can see that this group of cottages is all labeled Mexican cottages. And this would be where the married Mexican workers lived. Um, the white workers tended to have one family per cottage. The Mexican families tended to share cottages or be in apartment sized structures. So they were physically separated from the white community, both on the ranches and in the city of Whittier. White Whittierites in those oral histories don't really see the Latinx people as being part of the community. Um, they remember them as not being present. They remember them as not being in the school. And they shared some of the racist attitudes that um, the broader community had about Mexican and Mexican-American workers at that time, that they weren't very interested in education, um, that they weren't very ambitious, and that dovetailed with what growers thought. Growers felt that Mexican labor were good workers because they didn't really be, um, they weren't ambitious beyond the, the next couple of days in their basic sustenance. And the LA County Department of Health actually set up different health clinics for the Mexican and Mexican-American people because they believed that they were prone to different diseases and that it wasn't healthy for a mix of the two groups. So there wasn't formal um, uh, segregation the way there was in the South, but for all intents and purposes in Whittier, there was segregation in the 1930s. What this meant is that during the strike, when the um, ranchers and the business owners and the newspaper, who all were members of those same clubs, the owner of the newspaper was a president of the Rotary. And then shortly after that, the manager of the Leffingwell Citrus Ranch was a president of the Rotary. They were all in multiple clubs. All of those people had um, used that diet of racist ideology about Mexican American workers, the anti-communist rhetoric that they had um, coming through the clubs. And during the strike, they painted this narrative of Mexican American workers that were either be the ones that wanted to work were being intimidated by the radicals, and there were others that just wanted relief. 
And they also kept assuring people that they were getting laborers from the high schools and the college so that there wouldn't be any suspension of economic productivity. So they sort of traded on those three things, the two ideological things that they could trade on and economic anxiety to sort of get everybody on board. And really nobody in Whittier that wasn't a party to the strike ever questioned that narrative because they also went to these clubs and saw these narratives and the, those physical barriers meant that they didn't question it. Okay, quick shift uh, away from the strike into pacifism and social discourse. This was an important issue in Whittier. And in the 1930s, there were, um, peace came from many different quarters. There were people that were genuine pacifists like the Quakers, there were isolationists, there were also people that didn't want the US to get involved in conflict because they were pro-German uh, or pro-Italian. Uh, Gerald Nye was one of the speakers that came through in the service clubs and he spoke at the First Methodist Church. He was the chairman of the Nye Commission that sort of looked into questions of how the US became involved in the First World War. And so a lot of people, um, Merchants of Death, that book that was sort of an anti-war book came from that. And the Whittier College had a peace board that um, organized peace activism in Whittier. And the funeral director actually praised Neville Chamberlain when he came out with his famous piece of white paper saying peace in our times, saying, you know, here was a man that swallowed his masculinity and his ego in the interest of peace. In the same year as the strike, the Whittier College um, was participated in a national peace strike. Now, what's most interesting to me about this is that the, inter the national peace strike was organized by the American Student Union, which was explicitly and unequivocally a Communist Party organization. Uh, I haven't been able to confirm whether or not Whittierites recognized that, looked past it, didn't care, but they used anti-communist propaganda to um, fight against the strike but they were perfectly comfortable with a partnership with the communist organization in the peace strike. And one of the speakers was Jerry Voorhees. And this sort of gets at that complexity of Whittier political thought at the time. Most of the oral histories hated Jerry Voorhees when they talk about his politics. This is a political ad um, running against him. But when they talked about him, they all said, he was a great guy. He was nice, he would listen to us. He didn't care what party we were in when he was in Congress. Um, he started a school for boys. We just didn't want him there because he was too left, he was too pink. But he was also one of the um, speakers at this event and was praised for participating. So that's sort of my, um, just sort of scratching the surface of the complexity of political life and political discourse in Whittier. And I think some of the takeaways are that when people were interested in a topic, their political bias didn't really get away get in the way of them um, working across a philosophical divide like with Jerry Voorhees. Um, I think that one of the research things that I want to expand on is digging into those social clubs uh, because they were really the Facebook of their day. They were little intellectual echo chambers. Um, the ideas that were moving through them were networked with those same clubs in other cities. Uh, so there was, um, Whittier had its own networks that were connected to these other networks. And, you know, probably no surprise, but the segregation and racist ideology just created a barrier that meant that uh, the strike, I didn't mention that the strike didn't um, end in the workers getting the terms that they wanted, uh, but just those barriers prevent people from sort of building bridges and moving forward. Uh, so we see some instances where Whittier did have intellectual bridges. And in the case of Jerry Voorhees, you could sort of stretch from right wing to communist and agree on a, on a cause. Uh, but when there's barriers, then they hit a rock wall. Uh, I'll just put up a couple of slides in my bibliography if you wanna freeze on those in the recording. These are all great books. Um, there's a couple that dig into gym towns in general in more detail, uh, which is a, a very interesting topic uh, in California history. And then I just wanna thank the professors that helped me with this paper with my thesis and with the board that put this paper into perspectives. And uh, I can't let any recording go by without thanking my wife, Rosary, because she's really the reason that um, I got here. I actually wrote something for you guys to accept. And thank you again to Charlie and Leonard. Thank you for a, a wonderful presentation, Christopher. Uh, how do you think uh, World War I and its aftermath uh, affected the viewpoints of residents in Whittier during the 1930s? Um, I think it was consistent with 
the general national reaction. I think the difference was that the Quakers were pacifists going in uh, to World War I and they never really embraced the war frenzy that other groups did. But because we had that diversity of population, uh, I would say that there was also merchants of death and the, those, uh, I don't wanna say conspiracy theories, they were kind of like the granddaddy of conspiracy theories that we got into the war for the wrong reasons because the bankers wanted us there. Those percolated through the other channels and I would say that that was, there was a general sentiment that it was a mistake for the US to have gotten into the First World War. So the peace movement in Whittier was really that combination of core um, Quaker pacifism and the um, bitter reaction to America's experience in World War I and confusion about how the US came to be involved. Thank you. And uh, how do you think the uh, American individualism played a role in the 1936 Whittier Citrus Strike. And I'm thinking in particular about uh, the idea that uh, Americans were independent. Uh, it, it played into uh, sort of the, not an anti-union, but a, a, a reluctance to engage unions or other uh, community or group uh, groups that would advocate for themselves as a group as opposed to individually. I think it was very important because one of the things that the growers, and one of the reasons that they argued that the workers were under the thumb of radicals was that very un-Americanness to them of a group getting together and saying they should set the wages, um, that they should set the working conditions. The growers felt like the conditions were fine, that the wages made sense, and that if you didn't like it, you should move on. Um, and many of the Whittierites in particular, um, people came and made their fortunes and lost their fortunes in Whittier, not on a large scale, but these would be shop owners where they lost a shop or people that tried to have a small holding ranch and, and they couldn't get its way. So they certainly felt that they had done it on their own as American individuals. And I think that may have made fertile ground for them to respond to that anti-communist and uh, rhetoric that argued that the labor forces that were protesting were um, the other, that they were engaging in anti-Americanism. Thank you. And a uh, question from uh, the group. Uh, Terrence says, I've heard that Nixon was raised in poverty. Uh, do you know if that's the case? Yes. Um, Whittier was raised in poverty. And interestingly, he carried a big chip on his shoulder about that. Um, Whittier was not a rich community, but there were still people that were a little bit, had a little bit more and people who had a little bit less. Richard Nixon definitely had a little bit less. And when he was at Whittier College, um, he felt like he was looked down. He was sensitive about that. And on another note, I kind of wonder if that uh, sort of played into those fatal character flaws that got him into trouble later on. Uh, he's very well remembered by people in Whittier in the 1930s though. And interestingly enough, Dancing was not allowed at Whittier College until 1934, when Richard Nixon was president of the student body, he um, pushed through the change that allowed dancing on campus. Interesting. Uh, and, and much later on, when he was president, he actually signed the Environmental Protection Agency into law, which I think a lot of people either don't know or have forgotten. He's a very um, complicated fellow. I don't forget him for what he did bad, but I can't help liking him um, as a fellow. I I can't help disliking him, but I I'm glad of the things he did right. Uh, there's a, a question about uh, from uh, from Edward about uh, was uh, what role, if any, Earl Warren or Harry and Norm Chandler uh, or Asa Cole uh, in, uh, were involved in an opposition. I take it this is about the Citrus Strike, and uh, then he says, "How about Upton Sinclair?" Um, I honestly can't say because I didn't dig into the relationships with other communities as part of this paper. I did look at some of the LA Times articles. I mean, the Chandlers obviously were very anti-communist, so they helped set that stage. Um, interestingly, Whittier did not cover the um, Orange County uh, citrus strike very much in the paper at all, uh, which I found surprising. Uh, maybe not surprising, maybe they didn't want to get people to get any ideas. Um, and Upton Sinclair, 
I want and what to dig into him a little bit further, particularly because of the governor's race that he was in and because of ham and eggs. Uh, I focus a little bit more on ham and eggs as far as how people were talking about that. Uh, so I'm afraid that's on my future research list. I'm sorry, Edward. No, and I, I guess it's no surprise that uh, our country at that time and to some extent still is uh, sort of an Anglicized country you know, since we're uh, founded, at least in the East Coast, by the British. And, uh, and, and through our history, we've had uh, strong strains of racism. How do you think that might have uh, played out in the strike? Well, I think that it played out in the complete lack, not just of sympathy, but of interest in what the workers were um, complaining about, what they were asking for. Uh, the Whittier News, for the entirety of the strike and leading up to it and afterwards, never printed any interviews with any of the strikers, never spoke to any of the strikers. It only spoke to the managers of the ranches and what the managers of the ranches were saying about the strike and the striking workers. So I think that that just shows the complete um, disregard uh, and disinterest in what they had to say. Now, there was um, some poorer Whittierites, because uh, I didn't talk about all the groups, lived alongside the Mexican and Mexican American folks sort of in the in the strip of land next to Jimtown. And of course, they had a very different experience. But there you have, it's more about their economic class than about race. And I would say that one of the things I, I feel is that the racism and segregation was a tool leveraged um, for its economic, the economic power that it could achieve. It wasn't as ideological as maybe the racism and segregation in the South with African Americans. I think it was very much about the economics of the labor force, and it was a way to keep those folks separate. Now, I just on a personal note, I find it interesting that uh, one tends to grow up with uh, certain preconceptions about groups of people without ever having met anyone in that group. And then later on in life, you meet people in the group and you find out they're just human beings like uh, everyone else. And it, it really does change your perspective. Yeah. And a lesson it would be really nice if people would learn eventually. And uh, there's a question from uh, Terrence again. Uh, was the Pico Ranch already a museum during the New Deal era? Interestingly, yes. The Whittier Women's Club were actually responsible for restoring it. Um, I believe they did it in the late 1920s. Uh, and sort of making it into a, um, a museum and, and sort of a monument to the uh, age, the pre-American uh, age. I think we're uh, out of questions from uh, from the uh, from the audience, and I, I think I've uh, asked enough myself. I'd like to thank you uh, for your work, first of all, in developing uh, this paper. And then uh, I think you did an excellent job of the presentation and in answering the questions. So thanks for being with us this evening, Christopher.